What I would like to address today is a fundamental shift in the subject of communication, an alteration in the way we approach, theorize, and investigate communication that is designed to respond to the opportunities and the challenges of the 21st century. So what I would like to talk about is a significant reframing of communication research, a reframing that both challenges and changes the rules of the game. As you know, communication as a field of study is a rather recent development. And for most of our relatively short history, the theoretical focus has been on questions beginning with the word what. What is communication? This question is ontological in nature, and in addressing it, we situate communication as an object of scientific study and objective investigation. What I want to propose is a change in the basic question, a change from questions of what to questions regarding who. In other words, I want to argue for a shift in focus from the ontological question to what would be an ethical question. The main issue here is not what is communication, but who communicates. Who is the subject of communication? And who is subjected to communication? This shift in emphasis is, I will argue, not only necessary at this particular time in order to contend with the challenges of the 21st century, but it has the potential to reconfigure the entire field of communication research by opening new avenues of inquiry, developing innovative methods for investigation, and resulting in new kinds of opportunities for knowledge production. So let's begin with an iconic image that addresses itself to this very issue, a rather famous cartoon from the New Yorker magazine. The cartoon pictures two dogs sitting in front of an internet-connected computer. The one operating the machine says to his companion, on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog. This image has often been used in communication research to illustrate both the promise and the peril of what we now call computer-mediated communication. And according to this particular interpretation, what the cartoon portrays is that who one is in computer-mediated interactions is something that can be easily and endlessly reconfigured. Online, you can be whoever or whatever you want to be. This interpretation, although not necessarily incorrect, misses the more interesting and suggestive insight that is provided by the wired canines. Consequently, what the cartoon illustrates is not only the anonymity and indeterminacy of online identity, but also the expectation that despite this anonymity, users of the Internet automatically assume that the other with whom they interact and communicate is another human being. Consequently, what the cartoon illustrates is the standard assumption of mainstream communication theory and practice. Online identity is in fact reconfigurable. You can be a dog or you can say you are a dog, but everyone knows that what's on the other end of the fiber optic cable is another human user. Someone who is, despite what are often interpreted as minor variations in physical appearance and background, essentially like we assume ourselves to be. Now this assumption is becoming increasingly inaccurate. The fact of the matter is, the majority of online communication is not human-to-human -human exchanges, but interactions between humans and machines, and machines and machines. Current statistics concerning web traffic already give the machines a slight edge, with 51% of all activity being otherwise than human and this figure is expected to increase at an accelerated rate. In a recent white paper, Cisco Systems predicts that machine-to-machine -machine data exchanges will grow on average 86% a year and will reach 508 petabytes a month by 2016. So even if one doubts the possibility of ever achieving what has traditionally been called strong AI, the fact of the matter is our world is already populated by semi-intelligent artifacts or smart devices that increasingly play the role not of communications medium, but of information source or receiver. Communication studies must learn to come to terms with this development and reorient its theoretical framework in order to accommodate and respond to situations where the other in communicative exchange is no longer exclusively humid. This is, more than anything else, what will define the opportunities and the challenges for communication research in the 21st century. 
So let me begin by returning to the place where it all began, the point at which the computer was first theorized as a technology of communication. This occurs in Robert Cathcart and Gary Gumpert's 1985 essay, The Person-Computer Interaction. In this relatively early text, the authors draw a distinction between communicating through a computer from communicating with a computer. The former names all those computer-facilitated functions where the computer is interposed between sender and receiver, while the latter designates person-computer interpersonal functions where one party activates a computer, which in turn responds appropriately in graphic, alphanumeric, or vocal modes, establishing an ongoing sender-receiver relationship. Despite these two possibilities, communication studies has, with very few exceptions, limited its approach and understanding to the former. That is, it is typically understood and examined the computer as a medium of human communicative interaction, or what is now called computer-mediated communication. And defining the role and function of the computer in this manner is both intuitively attractive and conceptually sound. First, it situates the computer as at an identifiable position within the process model of communication, which was initially formalized by Claude Shannon and Warren Weaver back in the late 1940s. According to Shannon and Weaver, communication is a dyadic process bounded on one side by an information source or sender and on the other side by a receiver. These two participants are connected by a communication channel or medium through which messages selected by the sender are conveyed to the receiver. Communication studies typically locates the computer in the intermediate position of channel or medium. As such, it occupies the position granted to other forms of communication technology, like print, telephone, radio, cinema, television, etc., and it then is comprehended as something through which human messages pass. Second, this intermediate position is substantiated and justified by the traditional understanding of the proper role and function of the technological apparatus. According to Martin Heidegger, the assumed understanding of any kind of technology is that it is a means employed by human users for particular ends. Heidegger terms this particular conceptualization the instrumental definition, and he indicates that it informs what is considered to be the correct understanding of any technological innovation. Third, this instrumentalist understanding has been and remains largely unquestioned because it constitutes what epistemologists call normal science. The term normal science was introduced by Thomas Kuhn in his book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, to describe those undertakings that are guided by or follow an established paradigm or framework. Paradigms, according to Kuhn, are universally recognized scientific achievements that, for a time, provide model problems and solutions to a community of practitioners. Operating within an established paradigm provides students, scholars, and educators with a common set of assumptions and a foundation that they can follow for pursuing scientific research. This effectively puts an end to debates about fundamentals and allows researchers to concentrate their attention on common problems defined by a particular science. When the computer is understood and examined as an instrument or medium facilitating human communication, research generally concentrates on either the quality or the quantity of the messages that can be distributed by the system, or the kinds of relationships that are made between the human senders and receivers through this particular form of mediation. Evidence of this can be found, as Kuhn argues, in the contents of standard textbooks which address themselves to an already articulated body of problems, data, and theory. With little or no exception, textbooks in the discipline of communication studies within North America address the computer as a medium of human communication and seek to investigate the effect this technology has on the quantity and quality of human interactions and relationships. And in North America and Europe, computer-mediated communication has become normal science. It characterizes the work that I did early in my career, the investigations pursued by the majority of my colleagues, 
and the research interests of my graduate and postgraduate students. They are all, in one way or another, working on problems defined by the computer-mediated communication paradigm. Now, despite the remarkable success of computer-mediated communication, this approach unfortunately misses a crucial opportunity initially identified by Cathcart and Gumpert back in 1985. And that's the fact that a machine like a computer is not just a means of human concourse, but might also be considered a participant in communicative interactions. Now, what do I mean by this? Let's consider four examples. First, unwanted email or spam. Spam messages, which inform internet users of everything from herbal supplements, which promise to enhance the size and operation of various body parts, to bogus investment opportunities, are messages generated by and originating from a machine. As a result of the seemingly unrestrained proliferation of machinic-generated messages, users and network administrators now employ spam filters, which effectively decide which messages to deliver to human users and which ones to filter out. In the era of spam, therefore, email is no longer an exclusive instrument of human communication, but shows signs of increasing involvement by machines in the communicative process. A less nefarious illustration is provided by chatterbots that now populate the virtual environments of games, provide online customer support, and interact with users in all kinds of applications from e-commerce to web-based training. These chatterbots are able to converse and interact with users in such a way that is often indistinguishable from another human being, leaving many users uncertain as to whether their online interlocutor was in fact another person or a machine. A third example can be found in the area of customer service. When you call the bank and apply for credit over the telephone, for instance, your call is often taken by a human operator. This human being, however, is not the active agent in the conversation. He or she is only an interface to a machine, which ultimately decides the outcome of your application. The situation, in fact, inverts the usual roles and assumptions. In the case of credit application decisions, the machine is the active agent and the interlocutor in the conversation. The human operator is only an instrument or medium through which that machinic information passes and is conveyed. And the fourth and final example is available in the field of journalism with machine-generated content, or what is now called machine-written journalism. Beyond the simple news aggregators that currently populate the web, these programs like Northwestern University's Stats Monkey can automatically compose publishable stories from machine-readable data. These demonstration programs, although clearly in the early stages of development, recently led Kurt Cagel, the managing editor of XMLToday.org, to provocatively ask whether an AI may compete for and win a Pulitzer Prize for Journalism by 2030. So what does this all mean for research and communication? Let me conclude with three statements that have, at this particular point in time, something of an apocalyptic tone. First, communication studies as we have known and practiced it is at an end. We need, however, to be cautious with how we understand and employ the word end in this particular context. In the field of communication, the operative paradigm, the framework that has defined what is considered normal science, situates technology as a tool or instrument of message exchange between human users. This particular understanding has been supported and codified by the dominant forms of communication theory, has guided and informed the accepted practices of communication research, and has been considered normal by a particular community of communication scholars. And the success of this effort is clearly evident within the last three decades of the 20th century, with the phenomenal growth of computer-mediated communication as a recognized area of investigation and its institutionalization within professional organizations, standard textbooks and scholarly journals, and university curriculum. At the same time, however, it is increasingly clear that the computer does not behave according to this paradigmatic structure and effectively challenges long-standing assumptions about the role and function of technology in communication. 
For this reason, the computer is not necessarily a new technology to be accommodated to the theories and practices of communication studies as it is currently defined, but introduces significant challenges to the standard operating procedures of communications research, initiating what Kuhn has called a paradigm shift. So what is experiencing an end is not communication studies per se, but the dominant paradigm that has until now structured and guided both the theories and the practices of our discipline. Second, a new paradigm, especially during the time of its initial appearance and formulation, does not simply replace, reject, or invalidate the preceding one. For this reason, the previous modus operandi, although clearly in something of a state of crisis, or at least bumping up against phenomenon that it is no longer able to contain, can still be useful, albeit in a highly restricted capacity and circumscribed situation. We can see how this works by looking at another discipline, like physics. Within Newtonian physics, for example, what is true and what is false is determined by the entities, the rules, and the conditions that come to be exhibited within the Newtonian system. As long as one operates within the framework or paradigm established by this particular system, it is possible to define what is and what is not valid for Newton's characterization of physical reality. All this changes, of course, when the normal function in the science is confronted with an alternative, like that formulated by Albert Einstein. Einstein's innovations, however, do not simply invalidate or foreclose Newtonian physics. They simply reinscribe Newton's laws within a different context that reveals other entities, other rules, and other conditions that could not be conceptualized as such within the horizon of Newton's work. In an analogous way, the change in paradigm that is currently being experienced in communication studies does not disprove or simply put an end to CMC research as such. Instead, it redefines computer-mediated communication as a highly specific and restricted case of what needs to be a much more comprehensive understanding of the role and function of computer technology within the field of communication. Third, although the computer effectively challenges the current paradigm, placing its normal functioning in something of a crisis, what comes next, what comprises the new paradigm, is only now beginning to come into focus. And if the history of science is any indication for us, it may be quite some time before these innovations come to be formulated and codified into the next iteration of what will be considered normal science. At this pr preliminary stage, however, we can begin to identify some aspects of what the next generation of communication studies might look like in the wake of this development. From what we already know, it is clear that it is no longer accurate to define the computer exclusively as an instrument that is to be animated and used more or less effectively by human beings. The computer is beginning to be situated and understood as an other, another kind of communicative other who confronts human users, calls to them, and requires an appropriate response. This other aspect of the computer, as we have seen, was already predicted by communication theorists back in 1985. Communication studies, however, had, for reasons that are both understandable and justified, marginalized or ignored it, mainly because it didn't fit the established paradigm. In reframing the computer, according to the insights provided by this other and almost forgotten alternative, all kinds of things change, not the least of which is our understanding of who or what qualifies as a legitimate subject of communication. And in the process, we inevitably run up against and encounter fundamental questions of social responsibility and ethics, questions that not only were not possible to articulate within the context of the previous paradigm, but if they had been articulated, would have been, from that perspective, considered inappropriate and perhaps even nonsense. These are questions like, what is our responsibility in the face of this other? an other who is otherwise than another human entity. How do or should we respond to this other form of otherness? How will or should this machinic other respond to us? Who is able to be the subject of communication? And in responding to these questions, we will need to mobilize different theories, different methods of analysis, and different approaches to thinking the subject of communication. 
Although there's considerable work to be done in this area, we can already find innovative thinkers pushing in this direction. Norbert Wiener in the science of cybernetics is one of the early places in which we find this thought being articulated. We also see it in the work of Emmanuel Levinas and his conceptualization of an ethics of otherness. It's also evident in Donna Haraway in her writing on the cyborg and companion species. The information philosophy of Luciano Floridi, and also in the science fiction of writers like Isaac Asimov, Carl Capek, Philip K. Dick, and others. It is then the little things that matter, like the difference between two seemingly simple words, like what and who. But it is in this shift from an ontology of communication to an ethical question concerning the subject of communication that everything changes and begins to look different. This is, more than anything else, what I think will define the opportunities and the challenges of communication research in the 21st century.